the Star Trek replicator could instantly fabricate anything out of thin air. T. Earl Grey, hot. It may be science fiction, but one MIT professor says the real thing is coming, and soon. Neil Gershenfeld is the director of MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms. He teaches one of the university's most popular classes called How to Make Almost Anything. And he says the next digital revolution is right around the corner. How would you like to design almost anything you wanted and produce it on demand? So you say the next big digital revolution is in fabrication. Explain what that means. What's emerging now is a science of digital fabrication that lets you turn data into things so we can program the physical world. And what it's leading to, the science is how to make the Star Trek replicator, and the impact is anybody can make anything. Digital fabrication is already used for more than manufacturing prototypes or machine parts. NASA recently awarded a $125,000 grant for the development of a 3D printer that will create food from powders and oils. There are medical applications, like the production of custom-made prosthetic limbs. And believe it or not, scientists are even developing the technology to print human organs. And the machines that come to mind are kind of 3D printers that layer through through a kind of squirting process, layer by layer, build up something that looks like a physical object. But there are actually many, many different. Right. I've used every 3D printer from the beginning, but that's actually among the least useful machines. It's a little bit like in the 1950s, telling a chef the future of your kitchen is the microwave oven. Microwave ovens are good. We have them, but doesn't replace the rest of the kitchen. If a 3D printer is like a microwave, then what are some of the other kitchen appliances? At MIT's fabrication lab, there are high-powered lasers that can cut shapes very precisely, allowing two-dimensional shapes to fit together to make three-dimensional structures. There are machines that can cut wax for making molds and casting parts. There are water jet cutters where high-pressure water pushes abrasive sand to cut materials. There are also milling machines that can manufacture other fabrication machines. We're transitioning now to a stage where not only can the machine make something, but the machine can actually make its own parts. Nadia Peek, a PhD student at MIT, developed this machine. Controlled by a computer, it makes these inexpensive circuit boards. The circuit boards can, in turn, be used to control the machine. It can produce the parts it needs to run itself. Explain the... the, the the implications and the ramifications of this, because it strikes me as it seems to suggest that you, in a sense, have the, the, a complete transformation of manufacturing. Let's say I'm on an oil rig somewhere. Uh, I, I would have five of these machines that would just manufacture every spare part I ever needed, uh, things like that. could certainly do that, but that's only a little piece yeah. of the impact. The impact is much broader. Today, 3D printers deposit materials in layers. In the future, Machines will deposit or assemble digital materials. This means tiny building blocks will be designed to fit together perfectly, analogous to Legos snapping together. So just as pixels come together to make up images on computer screens today, these materials will come together as what are essentially 3D pixels, which will make up physical objects. Where the research is heading is, again, the Star Trek replicator which builds from the atoms on up. At a real molecular level, you assemble anything. And that's still maybe 20 years away. While we wait for the Star Trek replicator, students at MIT are finding plenty of ways to put digital fabrication machines to good use. I started a class called How to Make Almost Anything. It was overwhelmed with students. Single most popular class at MIT. I, I, I don't know if, but yeah, we're swamped with it. And then what they did was, Projects. A student made a device where you scream into it, it muffles your scream, but records it, and then at a convenient time later, it'll let it back out again. Another student made a dress instrumented with sensors and spine that defends your personal space if somebody comes too close. The variety of student projects demonstrated what Gershenfeld believes to be the killer app of digital fabrication. The students were showing, answering a question I didn't ask, which is, what is this stuff good for? And the answer is, not to make what you can buy in stores, but to make what you can't buy in stores. It's to personalize fabrication. The MIT students weren't the only enthusiastic pupils. Gershenfeld opened a fab lab in Boston's South End that provides free access to digital fabrication machines for local children 
teens and entrepreneurs in the community. We set up a community lab that was in between the research tools on campus and the Star Trek replicator in the future. It was maybe $50,000 worth of machines, and that was the whole project. But Gershenfeld's whole project soon got a whole lot bigger. When MIT and the National Science Foundation were asked to set up a fab lab in Ghana, and that was just the beginning. They started doubling. There are about 200 now. They've been doubling about every year and a half. They're above the Arctic Circle in rural villages in Jalalabad in Afghanistan in shanty towns. Every time we opened one, somebody else wanted one. The labs get used for education, learning skills. They get used for creating businesses. They get used for play. They get used to make art. Then we link them globally with video and online content. Around the world, people are benefiting from these fab labs, and the potential for this technology seems limitless. But as with many emerging technologies, there are downsides. Last month, a Texas-based company successfully fired a bullet from a gun that was entirely made from a 3D printer. Some lawmakers have rushed to ban these guns, and the State Department ordered that the online blueprints be removed. Before they were, the blueprints were downloaded more than 100,000 times. So should we worry? One thing that people have pointed out about digital uh, fabrication is you can make guns. Mm -hmm. You can make the keys to unlock any police cell in the world. You mm -hmm. can, you know, the, the, the power to use this in, in kind of disruptive ways is pretty intense. What do right. you say about it? Any remotely well-equipped workshop can make gun parts. And in fact, if I gave you a choice between a gun made in a, in a weak piece of plastic versus a gun made out of a piece of metal, you, you'd pick the piece of metal. You don't worry about the... the I mean, you're giving individuals enormous power that perhaps they didn't have before. Any technology in all of history has always been used for good stuff and bad stuff. It, it is at a cusp. What's limiting this and the opportunity is it's a real kind of reinvention of if anybody can make anything, how do you live, work, and play? Sort of how do you organize society?